actually live in eternity and not have it break down after five years, no less 10 million years, is for us to think and to feel and to act and to be as God. To love as he is loved within the Trinity forever. Always love uh, Bishop Barron's uh, explanation of the Trinity. That in the Trinity, we say God is Trinity and we say God is love. The two unique things that Christianity says. Mm -hmm. And he says that they're actually the same. That if we say God is love, what does it imply? It implies that we have a lover, a beloved, and their fruit of their love, which happens to be the ba very basis of all of our Christian and Catholic social teaching. You know, a lover, a beloved, and the fruit of their love. It's our family. And it is the Holy Spirit which then comes into us at our baptism, or however else God decides to do that. Confirmation. You know, Confirmation. Baptized, right? mm -hmm. um, that gives us a new life, not a new human life, but the very life of God, as Peter tells us to become partakers of the divine nature, as Paul will tell us, to hope in the glory of God, that it's literally God living in us, changing us from human nature to the divine nature, something we can't do on our own, that is so different from any other religious proposal. We can look at the tenets of Buddhism and we can say, that's magnificent, I want to live by that, and I will change my behavior to conform to this. But in Christianity, we don't just change our behavior to conform. It's almost the other way around. We change what we are, which changes what we do. And changing what we are is the miracle of Jesus literally living in us by the Holy Spirit. It's not conforming to belief. It's transformation. And that's the wonder of Christianity. That's the wonder of the Holy Spirit. And that's the greatness of the gift of both our baptism, which is reflected in John 20, which happens before Pentecost, where they receive the Spirit, but then something else happens on Pentecost. They receive the great gifts of the Spirit to go out and do the work of the church. So we see the difference between baptism and confirmation. That at baptism we come to life. We become capable of thinking, feeling, acting, and being as God is by His life in us. And then in Pentecost, it's no longer about us. We now have the great gifts and the fruits and the action of the Holy Spirit strengthen our life to now be for others. It's just a beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you so much. It, it is so beautiful. And I was mentioning, I was thinking about the Trinity before when you were talking about new life in Christ and how in John, the scripture that you read, it just so beautifully portrays the, the Holy Trinity because uh, Jesus says that mm -hmm. the Father will send uh, the advocate mm -hmm. and then Jesus breathes on them so it's the whole Trinity working in action there in that little little piece of scripture and I and I really love it um, that's great Megan yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. did you want to mention anything that uh, touched you about what John said or just in general I know um, you seem to be in agreement yes absolutely <laughs> um, just what John was saying, um, you know, inspiration, that's where it comes from, with, right, with the breath, and, um, oh, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where inspiration comes from, from that. Christ it gives us new life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and let's, uh, if you don't mind, let's uh, talk a little bit about your story, if, if you don't mind. Uh, at all. <laughs> um, so my friend Megan, we, we met at uh, Stony Brook at the Catholic Campus Ministry. And um, tell us what your major is there. Um, at Stony Brook, I'm an English major and writing minor. And I would like to pursue communications, um, if it's PR work or anything that has to do with writing and videos and just spreading the word of maybe God one day, because <laughs> that's what I'm passionate about as well. Um, well, beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, and just uh, tell us a little bit about, I know you mentioned before that you feel the Holy Spirit and God was guiding you towards Christianity and, and becoming Catholic. Uh, just tell us a little bit about your, your story and how you, you feel that that was working in your life. I think it's a great, 
uh, such a beautiful story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so also the way uh, what John said too, being a transformation, I can definitely say that when I met Christ and how um, I allowed him into my life, it was a complete transformation. And it happened very quickly in a good way. Um, definitely he was with me every step of the way. Uh, so I grew up in a non practicing Catholic home. I was, you know, I was baptized and um, kind of grew up with a, no, not kind of, I grew up with a fear of Jesus. And when my brother was making his communion at, at my neighbor's house with that class, I was helping out. So since I didn't make communion I'm like, while I was there, I'm like, I guess in the end of it all, I would have made my communion. But when they were talking about the story of Jesus coming back from the dead, it completely petrified me. And it wasn't like they said it in a scary way, just the fact that they said Jesus rose from the dead. Just hearing the word dead, that was it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I came home, walking home with my brother and my mom when she came and picked us up, and I said, what do they mean that Jesus came back from the dead? Is he here now? Mm-hmm. Why don't I see him? He's a ghost. Why doesn't anybody else come back from the <laughs> dead? And my mom's like, okay, that's it. Like, she did, she's like, we're done. I'm like, okay. So I didn't go back because of that huh. fear, the whole ghost idea. Um, so many, many, many years, like if ever ever came up with friends or conversations or TV, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like just whatever they believe, but it's not real. And people read the Bible like this is actually what happens. Like anybody can t- interpret it whatever way. Again, but it was really me just pushing it away. Because like, of that fear. Of that fear. That of moment. That mm-hmm. Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Cadavers rising from the dead. Yeah. Zombie movies, right? Yeah. <laughs> the Whatever. Holy Ghost. Yeah. So even I don't even yeah. say Holy Ghost now, like Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit, I don't. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I also grew up with, like, with a lot of anxiety. I've suffered with it tremendously. Um, and I, as I grew up, I didn't realize that I had anxiety. Um, and I went to, I got my, my associate's degree at Suffolk County Community College. And there, that's where I felt like I really flourished and was doing all these leadership um, roles that I always, like, dreamt myself doing and making a difference and giving back. But underneath that all, like, I really was pushed, I was pushed myself to a point of exhaustion because of the anxiety. If it was academically, um, just like clubs, you know, clubs. Were you, you were a, a leader of certain clubs in yeah. the Suffolk? That's nice. Which, um, which club were you involved in? Uh, I was part of the honors club. I was the PR position, position for that. I was the president of the National Science and Discovery Club. I I do have an interest and passion in science, so that's where that comes from too. <laughs> uh-huh. Cool. Um, I was the editor of the Cassandra Literary Magazine for two years. I started up with the other group of students uh, as the National English Honor Society, and I was the vice president for that. I was a peer mentor. Um, Great, a lot of good yeah, things, a, a mix lot of, of different things yeah, God working involved. in there, I'm sure, you know, exactly. just so, through your studies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Suffolk was definitely, I mean, even though it's a community college, it has that Catholic feel of everybody trying to help you and just getting to where you want to be and where they see you and your potential and everything like that. So it felt really at home. Mm-hmm. and after graduating and like really getting into the faith, I'm like, I've ended up all these, the professors or deans that I met and they were Catholic, which was kind of funny. (laughs) You found that afterwards. Afterwards. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Or they, you know, live out the faith as well. So when I graduated from Suffolk, I was supposed to to, to go to another school and uh, live there, but with the anxiety, I was, terrifying and I'm like what am I supposed to do now and I felt even though like all these different leaderships um, positions and um, responsibilities I was doing at Suffolk I still felt like 
I could not do anything. And and now that it, once I did graduate from Suffolk, I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I don't feel like I can live away from home. I feel like I literally cannot do anything. I felt hopeless and I felt completely desperate. And um, I went back to see a psychiatrist that I saw years ago. It is, I look back now, I'm like, I don't even know. And I know it's definitely Holy Spirit, God driven because I don't know how, how is it that like my parents or my mom really decided, okay, we're gonna go back and see this psychiatrist. So I went because again, it was that whole des- desperate feeling of, oh, I, don't, I can't do anything and I'm petrified of everything. I mean, I wasn't even eating at school. I was even at Suffolk, even though I loved being there, the anxiety was so bad that I would not eat until I got home. I didn't go out with friends. I was not driving. If anything, I was driving to Suffolk and going home. No highways, everything like that. And I actually used to carry like a vomit bag with me because I had a fear of being sick or getting sick. So all that being said, (laughs) <laughs> now it was like going to see the psychiatrist like you, you just as I'm sharing it's like you just saw how much how much I was kind of really struggling with that one anybody realizing how badly I was struggling so I was sitting in the waiting room and on the couch and being nervous as heck and it's like uh, here I am all this dirt is coming like all the dirt inside me is coming up and being mixed up sitting on the couch and one of the women in the office her door was open and I don't remember if she was really in her office but the one thing I say when I tell my story is I saw this picture of Jesus on the wall and I'm like who the heck does such a thing like who hangs a picture of Jesus on their wall again I really <laughs> like who does such a thing I've never seen anybody do that in my whole entire life at your home too. You yeah, not, not in my home, not in my aunt's grandma. I mean, at my grandma's house, I see like angels, but no Jesus, like nothing. Was Again. it was a divine mercy image of Jesus or just a, a regular it was like picture? A portrait. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And it's so. I mean, it's like my favorite. I have never came across that image again with anybody else having that, but it's what one it, of my favorite. It's just a portrait it's of Jesus. It's just a portrait, but it's so realistic that it's really. Mm-hmm. It was there when you needed it. Yeah, exactly. And right of course, there. I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I just kept staring at it like, again, <laughs> who the heck does such a thing? Mm-hmm. And so I go in to meet with a psychiatrist, and she get, refers me to um, the therapist, Rose Molfetta. And as I'm looking at the number in my hand, like, my gut instantly told me this is the woman that has the picture of Jesus on my wall. Like, gut feeling and everything. Well, it turns out my gut was right, and now we can all say that, you know, you're, I can say that my gut is always Jesus. <laughs> the, Holy, the Holy Spirit telling me. Mm-hmm. So I was completely right. The woman <laughs> that I was referred to, the therapist, was the woman that had the picture of Jesus on her wall. And when I met with her, of course, being nervous because it's a new person, and she asked me a question as she's writing down my response. I looked back at the picture and I said to her, I'm not religious whatsoever, so don't bring it up. Mm. I was that blunt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at that picture, but don't yeah, tell me don't, who that is. Said, I'm, not, yeah, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm interested, but don't tell no, me. Yeah, I'm, not even, okay, I'm not even interested. Just don't bring it up. I'm not religious. Don't go there. She's like, oh, it's fine. I just bring it up with people who come to me who are, you know, want to incorporate it, the faith into their sessions. I'm like, okay. I don't know what that meant at the time, but okay. So as you know, I mean, I continue sessions with her and I felt really comfortable and I just automatically like trusted her. Like there is some type of peace at the time. I didn't realize it, but I can, looking back, like I just instantly trusted her. And as sessions go on, um, you know, just getting to know her, her getting to know me. Uh, she told me that she's part of the National Association of Catholic Social Workers. So, I, you know, so that's where I understood, okay, that's why if people come for her specifically for the faith, she can because she's trained and certified in that. 
So that being said, again, it happened very slowly, bit by bit. Um, and it wasn't until in October. So I started seeing Rose in uh, the summer of 2014. So October comes along and my I was studying with a classmate for our English tests and I was we just started talking about anxiety and she suffered it with it too and she said that um, the one thing that has really helped her is her faith being Catholic and all and I'm like oh well I see a Catholic social worker <laughs> and I'm like and and she asked me who it was and I said Rose Malfetta and she's like oh I know her and I'm like, how do you know her? And she's like, she came and spoke at my church. She was talking about when she had, uh, she was going through this period of time in her life um, when she was hemorrhaging and she almost died and and then she was healed. And then I'm like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. And how much, like, and basically how Jesus healed her. And I'm like, well, this doesn't, like this I should be hearing from Rose and not from you <laughs> like it doesn't feel comfortable at all so when I saw Rose I brought it up how this my classmate knew about her and she how Rose you know came and spoke at her church and Rose is like yeah she said I she's Rose is also a speaker and she speaks about her um miraculous healing and um and she speaks other about other things within the faith and for teens and um, she told me her story, how there was a time that, you know, she was going through that time when she was hemorrhaging, you know, she could have almost died. And she was there, I, I remember this so specifically, so clearly, that um, she was praying to Jesus, saying to him that if he gets her through this, this she will continue in her life, will basically devote her work or what she does in her life completely to him and she, I mean she was healed and so it's like the story of the woman who was hemorrhaging and really touched the garment of Jesus and that really that day when she was sharing that story that story it was like really my opportunity to touch the garment of Jesus and can I just mention sure. something really quick? I like that passage too because Jesus' reaction, he turns around when the woman touched the cloak and he said, who touched me? Because it says in scripture that power, he felt that power went out of him. So that's really interesting how that ties in to the Holy Spirit and how they're connected again because the Holy Spirit uh, and Jesus and the Father are one. So he felt the power he felt the holy spirit leave him to help so that's just a great image of faith as well that that woman had that courage to touch and believe that okay if i just touch the cloak i'll be healed um so that's that's amazing yeah that's, like mm -hmm. you said the power like every time because i really got to know jesus through rose and after her telling me that story, she even asked me for that permission. She's like, um, Megan, can I tell you something? And can I mention God? And I said, yes. And she said, Megan, God has your hand on your shoulder. And for the very first time, I felt comforted. And since that day, it's like, again, bit by bit, I yearned to know more and asked all these questions. And as you said, like with the power, like every time Rose spoke to me, or told me something about Jesus or that love of God, because I finally put the two and two together through her words, you know, speaking to me, that there was that power from God. So you know that her words, are it was coming from Jesus to her and the Holy Spirit that way. So, yeah. That's really beautiful. Um, and from there, did you go to Stony Brook um, after meeting with Rose, or was there like a transition in your life? Did you, I know you mentioned you were studying, but mm -hmm. after Suffolk, so did you after, take a break? And then um, well, I ended up just doing another year at Suffolk after mm -hmm. I graduated from Suffolk in 2014 just to figure out where I was going. 
mm-hmm. and I ended up in Stony Brook. <laughs> Go figure, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and you think the last place where you find even get more involved in your faith being such a big university and everything like that. And I felt Stony Brook would be a good fit for me because it was close to home. And if I had wanted to live away at home, I had that opportunity because of the dorms. But it didn't work out that way either. But And I think a real big part of it was that Rose introduced me to Joanne, who is our campus minister at Stony Brook for New McLeod. Mm-hmm. And I went to go meet Joanne and said, you know, Rose referred me to you and wanted me to meet you I would like to meet you so I kind of told her my whole story and where I was coming from and I met Joanne and from then I went to their new McClub meeting toward the end of the semester and um, I went to go back and visit a dean and I told her at Suffolk and I told her my story and I had a feeling it was safe to tell her because I got this feeling that she was Catholic and she was and after telling her my whole story, um, walking away or driving back home from visiting Dean Reese, uh, it just, I know it was definitely Holy Spirit. It, it just occurred to me as I'm sitting at the traffic light to get on the highway to go home that I wanted to make my communion confirmation. So, so wait, as you were driving home from seeing Dean um, Reese, Dean Reese and talking to her about Joanne that you had well, met. Well, no, t- telling her, uh, sharing with her my story of how, like, you met Rose. You met Rose and how it has completely changed my whole life. And mm-hmm. I was, you know, I started going out with friends. I was driving, instead of actually carrying a vomit bag, I was carrying rosary beads. That's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> and I continuously do. <laughs> yes. As, you know. So I was telling Re- Dean Reese that. And you felt that inspired to uh, receive your communion and, and confirmation. confirmation. So I go back and see Joanne, and I tell her this, and it was maybe a month after I saw her, met her for the first time. And I said, and then Joanne just got so excited after <laughs> and jumped up, gave me a hug. Oh, nice. And I made my communion confirmation in April 2014, uh, 2016. Yay, that's so the awesome. Versus, uh, the, the, the courage of the woman to touch the garment. And the courage of someone with that much anxiety to touch as well. So thank yeah, you yeah. <laughs> yeah. for being so courageous to do that. Thank you. And sharing your story with us today and, uh, you know, that we all struggle, you know, I'm sure you're not the only one that, that struggles with anxiety and that, that gives us hope that we could turn to the Lord and he, uh, he helps us, um, like the opening song and that you were saying about the rosary and how that you carrying rosary beads helps you. Um, I like the image, I forget where it's from, but like when you're holding the, the rosary, you're, you're holding the Blessed Mother's hand. Oh, oh, I love that now. Uh, <laughs> what is that in your hand? A rosary. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like comforting, and yeah. you, it's like our link to, to heaven is, is a rosary. I, I really do believe that. Um, it's a great prayer and way to, to get closer to, to God. And um, I was just talking actually the other day with a, with a friend and you know how sometimes we struggle with the rosary or I do sometimes that we don't want it to be like a burden or something we have to do like, Oh, you know, we have to say the rosary now and you just kind of say the prayers, uh, our father, just to kind of get through it. But she said, try to maybe break it down. Or if you can't say one whole rosary, try to say one decade. Um, with like a faithful reverence or just invite Mary to help you as a friend, Mary, um, you know, pray with me. Uh, I I need your help. Uh, just pray to God for me. I mean, not in that blunt way, but you know, um, and she'll, she'll guide you. And I want to try to think of it like that as I, I do believe that there's such a peace and tremendous blessings from the rosary, but sometimes I think we get caught up maybe in the mechanics, the mechanics of it, or just, 
you know, just the, the, I guess it's the perseverance that matters, that it's better that we said some than yeah. nothing. Or, or, mm -hmm. or the intimacy. I know I have a very, very dear friend when I'm back in Maine, sometimes we would take some time after a faith sharing meeting that we had on Thursday nights to go before the tabernacle and pray. And we joke, but of course only half joke, that it was a family sitting around the table. You know, that you, you, you pull out these mysteries in, in the life of Jesus and the life of Mary. And to to open that dialogue, to to just picture that here we are, that's our opportunity to sit with the family around the table, to sit with Jesus, to sit with the Father, to sit with Mary, to sit with Joseph, to sit with Gabriel who brings the message. You know, and to actually in the midst of, of praying, praying as dialogue, praying as life, to you know, be in there in the in the meditating upon the Annunciation, actually turning to Gabriel and saying, That must have been quite a job. You know, what, what was what what was that like? What, what was it like to be there? You know, and, and thank you, Mary. That must have been amazing. And, and uh, to, to just actually take that time to dialogue with the family, to actually talk about them. And I remember I, I do work with RCIA. Mm -hmm. And as we do Mr. Goji, one of the things that we try to do is, is introduce them to the rosary. And as we would take time to pray, I would actually say, just, this is your family. Here it is. We're around, we're around the table. You know, the, the wine or the beer is on the table, whatever it happens to be, the nachos. Um, and talk to them. And then inevitably I find them trying to start this dialogue, but they're talking to me. I say, why do you talk to me? They're here, talk to them. <laughs> and it really is, it gives it that wonderful, relaxed, intimate, I'm, I'm with my family feeling as we're reliving these mysteries in the, in the life. So, and to believe that they are, you know, listening and they want to speak to you as well and help you just as Jesus is alive and wants to help you. Well, so. give thanks. Sit, sit there and say, thank St. Joseph, you're, you're here. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. You know, Mother, thank you. What, what if you had said no? I'm sure God would have found a way, but you, know, you didn't. Thank you. you know, thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, angels. That you, you, you're this amazing thing that you see that humans are to be made even greater than you, and unlike Satan who gets all upset at it, you're, you're here helping us. You know, what a wonder. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just it, it, that, that sense of that reality of the family sitting around the table in this rosary. I like that image. Yeah, Thank I you. Because, you know, when you say the rosary, we, like, as a family, you, you sit around the table or, you know, you, I could just picture that as, as something. So, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> and um, so uh, we also have Natalie here. Oh, thank you so much for, for your story and, and for sharing. Um, and I guess just to kind of, uh, from there, you're, you're still at Stony Brook and uh, Megan and your, um, still involved with the Newman Club yeah. and doing great things. Doing things that I never thought it, that I thought myself imagined doing and it's all because of God. It's not because you know anxiety just totally disappears. I learned that it's an emotion and it's something you tolerate and it's, you just do it with God. Well, what, what is the, what the Holy Spirit gives us fortitude among things? That strength to go and do what has to be done? To act upon the love that's within us? To, I always upload that line where, where Peter and John are dragged before you know, the, the, the Pharisees, or the Sanhedrin rather, and told them not to preach the name. They say, how can we not? Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing, how can we not act upon the love within yeah, us when exactly. it's that strong? Exactly. And I can say it, it's strong. <laughs> oh, nice. Amen. Um, okay, so let's, uh, so we have Natalie here. Thank you again for coming. and Thank you for having me. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, Natalie, tell us, uh, how, how old are you? <laughs> I think that's just so amazing yes, in itself. Um, I'm 15 years old. Yes. Um, <laughs> I like Megan's face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm about to be 16 next month. Woo. Um, as Katarina said, I'm a part of the St. Catherine of Siena Parish and the St. Vincent de Paul Parish is a combined parish. And, um, my story actually it's like it's ongoing i i don't want to say like um this period of time this is what this this happened to me that's how i met jesus like i i'm still um like going through my journey still on this path to find um to to um increase my faith and um actually my whole life um I've been a Catholic. I got baptized. I was, um, I received my first communion, my confirmation. 
but I'd, I'd, I'd have to say um, when my journey actually began was my confirmation. I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, that's when everything started. That's when like all the puzzle, the puzzle pieces like fit. Um, I was uh, confirmed two years ago, April of 2015. Um, and I chose my Saint, um, Saint Elizabeth of Hungary as my, um, my Saint to use. And I didn't choose it really because I knew much about her. I only, I only chose her because uh, Elizabeth is my mom's middle name. So that's why I chose it. So I didn't really have much, um, like so much of a relationship with my Saint. But as time passed, um, things started to like click and now I realize, you know, um, why I chose that saint. Like everything happens for a reason. So um, anyway, I got confirmed and at the time I was in eighth grade. Now I'm a, I'm a sophomore, about to be a junior in high school next year. And um, as the year went on, um, the month I got confirmed, I didn't really think much of it. Um, I've always been a part of the youth ministry. It's been, this is my fifth year in the ministry now. And um, I always participated, um, went to church every Sunday, participated in the activities that they held, the, the plays, the productions that they did, always went to the prayers. But I never actually felt that connection with Jesus until recently. I, I always believed in him. And, you know, I would pray to him, but like only like um, when I needed him. And um, I had the privilege to go um, on World Youth Day um, in Poland last summer. And that's when I would say um, that really was the, um, the factor that made me so devout in my faith and so invested in my faith. And um, that whole experience was just amazing. It it changed me to an extent I can't I can't even explain. Only only God knows, and it's something that I won't ever be able to explain. It's just that again that that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so good, and I never would have pictured myself going to Poland at 15 years old. I never would have imagined like. But then I also, when I went to Poland, millions of Catholic young people, and it's just, it was so amazing. And I, I've never experienced anything like it. And the whole, the whole, um, the whole trip was just it, life-changing, absolutely life-changing. I, um, I visited a country I'd never think I visited, Poland. Like, <laughs> yeah, like when you think yeah. about it at first, you're like, oh, what's in Poland? But actually, there's Poland has so much to offer. And I really <laughs> underestimated Poland. Um, do you have the Divine Mercy Shrine? Um, I visited that. I went to um, St. Faustina's uh, home. I did a lot of, um, you know, like exploring around all the towns. I went to St. Maximilian Kolbe's home and like his like monastery where he prayed, where he stayed. It was very powerful. And also I went to Auschwitz and Birkenau and I really got to experience, you know, that was something very powerful on the trip. And um, the whole feeling was just so surreal. Walking through the concentration camps where like thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews were executed not only Jews but um like Catholics too gypsies um you know it's just it was just life-changing and I got to see the world in a whole other different perspective and also after the trip um I had the privilege to go to Fatima in Portugal after Poland and yeah. Oh, Megan, one day you'll go. Uh, God will yes. provide the way. Yeah. If Stephanie's listening, right? Stephanie, we're going to go one day. Yes, it's yes. absolutely beautiful. I was just, God put so many blessings on that trip and it's just, I'm eternally grateful for that. And um, in Fatima, it was a lot different than in Poland because in Poland there was a lot of people, but in Fatima there wasn't a lot of people. So it was very peaceful and um, 
the um it's very uh it's the, like there's like no word to describe like the feeling you get when you're there it's just it's absolutely amazing and i the blessed mother was truly present and um it was something that i will never ever forget and something that um will always be in my heart going to Fatima. And actually, um, Fatima is, um, they have, uh, what's it called? Like a, a kneeling path where you, um, at the beginning there's a, you kneel and you like kneel your way to the, um, to like a, a chapel. And that was it's, where the Blessed Mother appeared. Yeah, that's where the Blessed where Mother the appeared chapel. to the children. So mm -hmm. you, it's a path when you kneel and you go there. And then it doesn't look difficult, but it, is. it definitely <laughs> is. It's so painful, especially on your knees and the, the type of... Um, like the, the type of material, like the... It's a smooth surface, but it Yeah, but it's slides. like rough yeah it's rough at the same time and, and um the first time i did it i was looking for a connection but i didn't really feel it so then the second time i did it i was looking for a connection i didn't feel it and then the last day we were in fatima um we decided to go to um to the the shrine and um like just observe like nobody was there the sun was rising beautiful and i was like okay i'll give this like a lot the last chance like if i really like feel something so i got on my knees and i started praying the rosary and the feeling was just amazing i i'm like shaking right now like talking about it like it's just the sun was rising the, the sky was it was like a purplish it was just absolutely beautiful and that was my last day there and sadly um we had to leave. We went to Lisbon after, though. Just fun, but that <laughs> I rather stay in Panama. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like just that trip overall was just very, very life changing. And um, after the trip, I got back. I shared, you know, with the parish how I just I felt like a whole different person. I prayed a lot more. I started going to church like three times on the weekend, Saturday, I went Saturday evening, I went like to two masses on Sunday. Like I just, I wanted to be with God 24 seven, but obviously God is with me 24 seven. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, um, that happened and um, I feel like World Youth Day like really helped me. I prayed so much for the future year of, of um, of like my, uh, my my next year in school, I prayed for like success, for like, um, you know, like no distractions. You know, I really wanted to do well, especially in 10th grade, so then I can um, be prepared for 11th grade, which is the hardest year in high school. And this year I've been doing so well, so well than I've ever done before. And I know it's all because I prayed for it and I continue to pray for success in school, for my academics. And to tell you, it's like, it's very challenging trying to maintain a, a good spiritual life, a good um, social life, and trying to um, balance your school all in one. It's very challenging and it's very tiring, but honestly, I can do it all through the strength of God. He, the Holy Spirit helps me tremendously. I'm always like, um, like praying, like I catch myself like, praying to God, like in the middle of the school day, I'll, like whenever um, I need patience, because in high school, you need a lot of patience <laughs> to, deal with all, to deal with these people. It'll, it'll, it'll stay that way. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, Lord, please give me patience. And it's, it's very difficult trying to um, be so faithful in high school, because you have all these other kids who have all these different religions and a lot of kids who don't even believe in God at all. And they try to enforce that upon me, but I know that um, God is real and, you know, that's my God. That's, I try to, um, I try, I try to, you know, stay open-minded, like not shut their like beliefs out or like, you know, you can believe in whatever you want, but like, you know, 
I'll believe in, you know, my God. And, um, yeah, so. And tell us, um, so you're going to be 16 this year and what you decided to do to, to celebrate. I, I think yes. that's very inspiring um, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Actually, um, so I'll be 16 in July and, um, instead of having a sweet 16, like, uh, the generic plan of, you know, of, uh, the society having a big party with like, all your friends and family, big dress, big cake. I decided to steer away from that. And I decided to go on another pilgrimage and <laughs> I'm going, um, at the end of this month, I'll be going to Portugal, back to Fatima, um, France, I'll be going to Lourdes, I'll be going to Spain, and then I'll be going back to Poland. Can, and Can we fit in your luggage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wish, I wish. Me and Megan want to go. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Honestly, it will be your, uh, or will be your tour guide. guide. Yeah, <laughs> guys, you know, the uh, cha chaperones. There we go. Chaperone. <laughs> Honestly, I, ever since I was little, I, I wanted a Sweet 16. I would watch those shows, my, my big Sweet 16. I'm like, Mom, I want that. I want that. But as um, the year went, the years went by, especially this um, past year, I really was able to recognize all, like all my priorities and like my first priority is always God and you know doing whatever I can to get closer to him and God has blessed me with another pilgrimage two pilgrimages in one year and I feel like I was chosen like I'm I was handpicked by God and it's just an amazing feeling and it's it's so overwhelming but it's the good type of overwhelming and it's just that love that he has for me is just it's just amazing but um also i wanted to mention about world youth day there were so many young people and i feel like um the youth of this age has such a bad like connotation and um i feel like a lot of people think that oh these these kids they're all into um like partying drugs like alcohol you know, they just have a like a negative like you know effect, and um, to tell you the truth, not at all. Like I feel like there's so many, so many um, young people who are striving in their faith, and I I've, I've seen it, I witnessed it, and it's just um, it's amazing. Honestly, World Youth Day, I really that's when I realized that I was not alone in my faith. Being in a school that's so diverse, a bunch of religions, I realized that World Youth Day that it's like um, there's so many other people just like me, young too, and it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to my saint, actually, um, um, I never really developed a relationship with my saint, Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, um, but actually. Just a couple months ago, um, I was doing the um, the monthly devotion for the Blessed Mother for her 100th year of Fatima. And every month, the first Saturday of the month, um, you go to you go to Mass, you receive the Eucharist, um, you go to confession, you pray the rosary and sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament for a, an amount of time. And I was doing that, but one Saturday... Um, there was a, a speaker at a church in Melville, and um, it was on a Saturday. It was the first Saturday, so I was, like, kind of hesitant, hesitant to go because I didn't want to miss anything. I didn't want to, um, like, miss mass or – okay, um, yeah. So then um, – You didn't want to miss mass, yeah. but you decided but to I go. But I decided to go to see what it was about. It seemed interesting. Paul J. Kim, um, he spoke – He's a great speaker. Um, uh, and then after he spoke, I, um, I realized that the parish name was St. Elizabeth of Hungary. So I was just like, wow, <laughs> like the Blessed Mother really called me to be here. And then they had mass and they offered confession and conf confession was right in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And just all the puzzle pieces fit together. And I, my first, uh, the, the Saturday, I devoted to um, 
was there. I seen Elizabeth of uh, Hungary, the parish in Melville. Well, actually, I was there that day. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, church. I was, I was volunteering with Mary Ann Sheridan and Joanne yeah. and some of us mm -hmm. Newman. Yeah, she was there. Yep. Um, I was there. Cool. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so I just felt like that's the Blessed Mother right there, the Holy Spirit. And that I feel like I connected with my saint there. So I'm still on my journey to faith, and I can't wait to see where I'll be in a couple of years. Yes, well, you're such a great role model as well. Thank you so much for sharing. And I wanted to mention as well that um, Living Waters Catholic Counseling Center is located um, on the grounds of St. Elizabeth's Church as well. And um, I know we've mentioned before on the show, it's a uh, Catholic uh, counseling center, but you don't have to be Catholic to go. Um, it offers um, uh, counseling, uh, spiritual direction as well. And I just found out the other day, too, I always assumed that it was St. Elizabeth, the Mary of uh, the mother of Mary, mm -hmm. but then you, you said that it's St. Elizabeth of Hungary, so it's uh, yeah. very interesting. So um, we're going to wrap up today, uh, but it was such a great show, and thank you so much for, for listening and for John for coming and uh, Natalie and Megan. And Thank you for the invitation. Oh, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> we just want to wish you a very blessed weekend, and God bless you. And have a great, uh, great weekend and Pentecost Sunday tomorrow, tonight. <laughs> Yay. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Till next time.